Genesis chapter 12, very, very familiar passage of scripture. If you haven't been saved, uh, I mean, if you have been saved for any amount of time, you have probably heard about the man that we're going to talk about today. His name is Abram. Uh, and particular, in particular, God came to Abram. And this verse right here, I, I think most all of us have read it at least once or twice or 20 or 30 or 40 times. But in verse 1, it says, Now the Lord has said to Abram, Get out of your country. Get away from your kindred. Get away from your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now, let me tell you something. It's one thing to get away from your country and to pick up and move and start all over if you're young. You know, when you're young, you ain't got no sense and you just go for it. How do I know that? I've been there, done that. But you know, I want you to understand that Abram was about approximately 75 years old when God said, I'm ordering a change for your life. You're like, God, why didn't we, you could have just done this in my 30s. It would have been a lot easier. And not only that, but his wife, Sarah, was 65 years old about that time. And here comes God. Just when you least expect him to change your world or to rock your world, here he comes. Telling you to get away from your country, your family, your father's house. And go to a land that I will show you. That always gets me right there. Because he didn't even give him specific, a, a specific place to go. He just said, I'm going to show you. So in, in, in other words, if you're going to find out where I want you to go, you have to start moving by faith. You're going to have to start. Look at somebody and tell him you got to move by faith. And so the Bible says in verse 4 that Abraham departed as the Lord spoke unto him. Verse 7, and it says, And then the Lord appeared to Abram, and he said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there, at that moment, he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Go on down into verse uh, 10. The Bible says, Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass... He, uh, when he was close to entering into Egypt, that his, he said to Sarah, I want you to listen to this smooth operator right here. He, he said to Sarah, his wife, he said, look, I, indeed I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen that when the Egyptians see you, that they will say, this is his wife and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister so that it can be well with me for your sake. Oh my God. He is such a talker. And that I may live because of you. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abraham well for her sake. Well, thank you, sir. He had, she, he, he had sheep and oxen and male donkeys, male and female and, and servants, uh, fem, uh, uh, female servants and female donkeys and camels. So in other words, uh, this man just loaded Abraham up because of Sarah. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because, because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh, he didn't say Abram's sister. He said Pharaoh, uh, Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh, uh, and Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that this was your wife? Why did you say that she was your sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way because there is trouble that'll make the devil let you go because when God gets on your team and he starts fighting for you see when it comes to the, that kind of fight you are no match for God so now now therefore here here take your wife take her and go away so Pharaoh commended his men concerning him and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had what I think is cool right there is in spite of his mess ups, Pharaoh did not take the things that he had given him. He let him go with all of the blessings that he had given him. That 
That's something right there to me. And then go to 13 and one. And then Abram went up from Egypt. What I want you to notice is in verse 10 of uh, 12 and verse 10, the Bible said he went down into Egypt, but now he's on his way up. And go, go to verse three. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place of the altar, which he made it there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. We're talking about guardrails today. And I don't know any other guardrail in your life that is any more powerful than your prayer life. Your altar is a major guardrail in your life. Look at your neighbor on the right and say, neighbor, whatever you do, you can't lose your altar. Turn to your other neighbor, say, neighbor, you can't lose your altar. Oh, you can't, you can't afford to lose your altar. Your life revolves around God. Your life revolves around hearing his voice. So whatever you do, you gotta be able to hear him and the way you hear him is when you build an altar and you give him your ear. Father, today I love you and I thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that the grass will wither, but the flower will fade, but your word will always abide. It will be there. It will stand fast in our lives. Today, I don't know who needs what I am about to say, but I pray God that by your spirit, that you will give every person in this room and those that are watching online an ear to hear. And when we leave here, we will leave here changed because of your word, not because of a person, but because of your word. Bless now in Jesus name. Somebody holler amen. amen. On your way down, hit somebody and tell them don't lose your altar. Don't lose your altar. I'm gonna give you just a quick backdrop uh, just to kind of set this up for you a little bit this morning. The Bible said that in the beginning that God created everything. He created everything. He created the sun, the moon, the stars, the galaxies. He did the, divided the waters that were above the firmament from the waters that were beneath the firmament. He created the earth. He created the world. He created the entire universe. And then once he created it, he populated it. And he populated what he created with plants and with fish, with vegetation, with birds, with animals, and ultimately, finally, with human beings. And the Bible said that it was good. As a matter of fact, the Bible said it was very good. That is until Adam and Eve violated the one and the only rule that their creator gave them to obey. He said, of all the trees, the millions of trees that are here, he said, you can eat from all of them, but there is one tree, one fruit in specific, one fruit tree in specific that you are not allowed to touch. And when they chose to ignore the grave warning that came from their creator and decided to eat it anyway, it changed everything. Their choice to disobey God was an act of rebellion. And out of that act of rebellion, it changed the entire way that the world would operate. Before the fall took place with Adam and Eve, everything worked uh, hand in hand. It worked in, it, synchron, it, it was synchronized and it worked and it flowed by the grace of God. But afterwards, after the fall, the world became characterized not by peace, joy, righteousness, but it became characterized by suffering, by disease, by pain, by selfishness, by violence, and by death. The entire human race became so corrupt that God decided he would destroy the, the entire earth, the, every person that was on the earth, and he decided he would do it through a flood. He did that, and he destroyed every person except for one man, and this one man, his name was Noah, and he preserved Noah and his entire family. And he gave the world, through this, he gave the world a brand new beginning. But several generations later, after this new beginning, even though the population rebounded, the moral conduct, the moral condition of people, it did not rebound. 
And, and yet, what I think is so amazing about God is that rather than turn his back on his creation, and rather than turn them over to their self-destructive ways, he decided he would establish a plan to redeem his world. And he did it by beginning with one man. He would make this one man a recipient of his grace, and he would establish him as the founding father of a new nation. In, in time, this new nation that would be established, uh, it would become the, the nation, it would become a means whereby that God could have the opportunity to be introduced to every person. The one, the true, the living God would have the opportunity to be introduced and be connected with every person. God's redemptive plan for his world began at the choice of just one man whose name was Abram. Now we know him by the name Abraham. That's what we call him. But he was born Abram. And at a very critical point in his life, God changed his name. But for the first 99 years of his 175 years, he answered to the name of Abram. Abram was just an ordinary citizen. He was an ordinary member of society. He was no different from his neighbors. As a matter of fact, like his neighbors and like his relatives, he worshiped idols. He was into mythology. He chose to believe mythology is truth. And yet it was to Abram, this sinful, superstitious idol worshiper, that God showed up and appeared to him and said, leave your country, your kindred, get away from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And he gave him some promises and he said to him, if you'll do this, I'll make you great. He said, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will make you famous. I will bless you to be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you and I will curse those that curse you. And through you, sir, all of the family, the families of the earth will be blessed. Why Abram? Out of everybody, why would God go to him? Just hit somebody next to you and tell him it was just grace. It was grace. It was nothing more than grace. He, he did nothing to earn this. He did nothing to deserve this. And only heaven holds the reasons as to why God would pick this man whose name was Abram. God simply wanted to use him. And because he wanted to use him, he appeared to him. He was chosen by God. He was blessed by God. And as a result of the relationship that the two of them established, he became the one to whom God would reveal his secrets. He became the one that God would refer to, oh, that's my friend, Abraham. He was one of the first great intercessors that the Bible talks about. His prayer life caused him to know God. And knowing God was important because in knowing God, it, it, it gave him the faith to step out and to believe God. Abram was a man of many, many convictions. He was a man of principle. He was a man of wealth. He was a man that had lots of promises. And yet his hope was never in the promises. His hope was in the promiser. Because let me tell you something today. The God, the God that is behind the promise is greater than the promise. And he told us in his word that if you keep your mind stayed on me, I will keep you in perfect peace. Abraham was greatly blessed by God. And he, yet he taught us, as long as you cling to things that are material, you will never embrace the reality of the promises of God. Abram could have never become Abraham. He could have never become the father of the faithful. He could have never become a mighty man of faith if he had continued to live his life where he had lived it for 75 years in the land of Ur. Ur was full of idolatry. Had he stayed there, he would have, it would have seriously affected the outcome of his life. Think about your life. Think about the, the places that had God not pulled you out of, you would not be where you are today. But God in his grace and God in his mercy came to you, revealed himself to you and said, get out of here. You don't belong here. And so 
God came to Abram. He said, get out. He said, even though I know this is your home, this is your comfort zone. He said, I, I, I'm calling you to come out of here. And Abram had to lay, lay it all on the altar, him and his old self, and stop. He had to stop and he had to walk away from his comfort zone because comfort and growth never coexist. I said, comfort and growth never coexist. So in order to make an advancement in the kingdom of God, he had to lay some things on the altar. Let me tell you today that if you're ever going to have any real advancement in the kingdom of God, it will involve an altar on which you lay pieces and fragments and, 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 and things that are dear to you. You will have to lay them on the altar. Every last one of us. If you did not get the, the if you were not here for the service when, when uh, Pastor Meadows was here, I want to encourage you to pick that up because he gave us he gave us a view of the altar that was incredible uh, but Abram Abram understood that altar let me tell you something about him Abram ultimately Abram loved God and he served God and he he absolutely believed God and he consecrated himself to God he was a great husband he was a great he was a great friend but the thing that made him such a great person was was not 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 all of his money or not all of his cattle or not the things that God, that God had blessed him with. The things that made him a great man was the fact that he understood what it meant to have an altar. What is an altar, if you think about it? It is more than what you are looking at up here on this stage. An altar is a place where, 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 where things begin to change in your life. It's the place where change occurs. Think about alterations. You take your clothes to an alterations place and when you take them back out, they are different than they were when they went in. Why? Because they have been altered. It is where you touch the Almighty. That's what the altar is. And it's also where the Almighty turns around and touches you. It is the place where you humble yourself. When you go to the altar you humble yourself and that's important because I don't care how tall you are you still have to look up in order to see him an altar is a place that you have set aside exclusively for communication between you and God can I tell you if you never never ever own a house or a car if you never own your own business if you never have a a, a tailor-made suit if you never have fine jewelry or furs or anything that the world would call luxury. If you never have any of that, it is imperative that you have an altar. If you never have a friend, if you never have a, a, a child, if you never have a spouse, if you never have anybody that you can call a confidant to your life, if you have him, you will have everything. You, you've got to have that altar. Every believer needs a spot in their life that they mark out and they say, this right here is praying ground. If I can just get to my praying ground, it's going to be all right in my house. Look at somebody and tell him you need praying ground. This is a little dry if you can help me with it. You need a place in your life where you separate and you isolate yourself. A place that you shut yourself in and you shut everybody else out. You know what I'm talking about. Not only do you need a place where you can build a physical altar, but you need that spot in your heart that you don't give to anybody else. It's the spot that is off limits to everybody else. It is, it is, it is a place that, that you say, this is just me and God right here. It's the place where you don't let nobody in but God himself. It's where the altar is also where you lay a knife to your fleshly attachments and you start cutting things out of your life and you say, if I got to let go of you in order to have more of him, then just give me the knife because I got to cut this thing out of my life. Your altar is a place where you don't make any apologies for it. I make no apologies for my altar and I make no exceptions for it either. When you have an altar, you defend it with everything that you have in you. And just for the record, let me set the record straight and you ought to set it straight too. You ought to let people know right up front just because you are in my life. It doesn't matter how close we get. You will never get my altar. You know why? Because if you get my altar, then you've got me. 
I'm not saying you can't love people. I'm not saying you can't be good to people. But I am saying that there ought to be an inner sanctuary. When I can't go to a place and kneel down, there ought to be an inner sanctuary. A place that is reserved for God alone. He's got reserved seating in my heart. He's got reserved seating in my life. And you don't let anybody sit in the seat that belongs to God. You don't let a spouse. You don't let kids. You don't let friends. You don't let your mama. You don't let your worries. You don't let your bills. You don't let anything sit in the seat that belongs to him. You don't let anything get in that place because it is that place where God restores you. It's there where he renews you. It's there where he preserves you. And it's there where he stabilizes you. I am and you are who you are simply because of that place. You are who you are and I am who I am because of my altar. And if I give up my altar, I can't be the woman that I need to be. You can't be the man that you need to be. I can't be the friend. I can't be the leader. I can't be anybody that I need to be if I don't have an altar. Because here's why. If I lose my altar, I lose my convictions. I lose my consecration. I let my standards fall and I sear my conscience. And then I might become somebody that you don't even know. As a matter of fact, you might not even be able to recognize me if I lose my altar. And that is why I got to keep my altar. Look at somebody and tell him you can't have my altar. Having an altar was important. Abram had an altar. Noah had an altar. Moses had an altar. Gideon had an altar. Saul had an altar. David had an altar. When the rain ceased and the flood subsided, the first thing Noah built was not a database so that he could build a ministry. The first thing that he built was not a house. No, it wasn't, it wasn't a business. He didn't come off the ark and say, I'm going to build a church now. What is the first thing he built? The first thing he built was an altar. And you know why he did that? Because he needed a place to offer sacrifices to the God that brought him safely through the storm that he was in. My question to you today is, do you have a place where you can say, I just want to say thank you today? Lord, a place that says, I honor you today because if it had not been for you who was on my side, I would have never made it through. You got to have a place where you just say, God, I give it to you. That is my altar. My altar is where my life changes. It's where, my, it's where I wrestle down my desires. It's where I decrease and God increases. It is where the turning of the soul takes place. Under thee, O oh Lord, do I lift up my soul. What is your soul? Your will, your intellect, and your emotions. Your altar will help you wrestle down the old man and allow the new man to come to life. We need our altar. God will give you answers at your altar. Look at somebody and ask them, have you prayed about it? He will give you answers at the altar. He'll give you direction at the altar. He'll give you strategies and you'll find a way to figure it out and put it all together at the altar. He'll give you counsel at the altar. He'll give you hope when you are at the altar. And nothing will anchor you. Nothing will save you. Nothing will hold you steadfast, unmovable, like having an altar in your life. When I have been through the fire and I've been through the storm, if I have an altar in my life, I can say winds go ahead and blow. But when it is all said and done, I'm going to still go that direction because that's the direction that God has assigned me to go. When your heart is overwhelmed, the good thing about God is when you got him, you don't have to run to people. Oh, you don't have to call people. When your heart gets overwhelmed, you can say, lead me to the rock. That is higher than I am. Because his word said, call on me in the day of trouble. And he said, I will answer you. Abram had an altar. He had faith. He had an assignment from God. And he was going to do it. But then something happened and he went down into Egypt. What does that mean, Pastor Brady? Going down into Egypt is, is pretty much like aligning yourself with the world. With the spirit of this age. It, it's like you depend on the arm of flesh 
And Isaiah told us, woe unto them that go down into Egypt. I, I get it. I know there was a famine and he got scared. But how much better would it have been in his life if he would have just said, you know what, God, I'm going to throw all this back on you. You're the one that told me to move. You're the one that has me where I am. And I, there is a famine in the land. I need you to provide for my household. You brought me here, God. I didn't bring myself here. How much better would it have been if he'd have just said, it's up to you, God. You got to take care of us. And rather than trying to, rather than trying to see God through a famine, what he should have done was he should have solved the famine through God. Because God says, I am Jehovah Jireh. And it doesn't matter that you don't have a job. It doesn't matter that you don't have a paycheck. It doesn't matter that you don't know where your next meal is going to come from. Look at it through my eyes. I am Jehovah Jireh. I've never forsaken you. I've never failed you. I got you through this. And Abram, who was God's friend, who was God's man of faith, he was a man of integrity, a man of character, and yet he still went down into Egypt. Went down there and got sucked into paganism and more idolatry. God's friend, do y'all hear me? God's friend found himself overwhelmed by his environment. If God's friend, the father of faith, finds himself overwhelmed by his environment, then that makes me feel a little bit better when I feel overwhelmed by mine. So he goes and he messes up and he gets overwhelmed. And now the man of faith becomes a man of fear. Uh, who's the woman that's with you, sir? Um, that's my sister. He lied. She wasn't his sister. Well, wasn't she kind of his half-sister? There is an element of truth to that. Yes, there is, but he meant it as a lie. He meant it as a lie. And now, because of what he is facing, God's friend, God's man of faith, God's man of power, he has now become a liar. Why in the world would Abraham lie? I'll tell you why. Because one sin will always lead to another. One sin, I ain't going to get much help in here today, but one sin will always lead to another. And so when Abram lost his altar, he lost his faith. When he lost his faith, he went down into Egypt. And when he got down into Egypt, he lost his courage. And now he's become a liar. Do you see how little by little by little, the progression of his life started going downward. You'd, he, he went down into Egypt and he started lying. You'd be shocked to know how many liars are in the church. You'd be shocked. People that lie, and they don't even have to lie. They lie, oh, oh, and they'll tell you about friends that they don't have. They'll tell you about money that they don't have. They'll tell you about accomplishments that they never accomplish. And they do it just so that they can feel like they can fit in. They compromise their standards. They compromise their principles. They compromise their character just so that they can be accepted. Abraham was terrified. And because he was terrified, now he commits a cowardly, indefensible act. And he endangers his own wife, whose name is Sarah. He exposed Sarah to danger. He exposed her to rape and he did it all because of fear and all because of selfishness the man of faith the man of promise he was doing so great until he went down into Egypt and he was on his way to the promised land he was on his way to his vision to his purpose to his destiny but because he went down into Egypt now he's becoming something that even himself he doesn't like what he is saying he should have never went down there Hit somebody next to you and tell them, stay out of Egypt. 
Stay out of Egypt because there are just some places that you don't go. You, y'all hear me today. There are just some places you don't go. There are just some things you don't do. There are just some people that you don't hang out with. And it doesn't matter who you are. And it doesn't matter what your title is. He was the friend of God, but he still needed some boundaries in his life. He still needed some guardrails in his life. Oh, I don't, you, I don't care how anointed you are. Even a Anointed people need guardrails in there. Woo! That means you don't stick your head in every conversation. Sometimes you just walk by and you're like, oh, nope. I'm out of that. You don't stick your head in every door that opens. Every door is not a blessing. I said every door is not a blessing. You don't answer every call that comes on your phone. I've told you before, get caller ID, identify the devil. That's what ID stands for. I don't care how anointed you are, you need some boundaries in your life. Quit acting like I'm not talking to you today because I am talking to you. I'm talking to you, I'm talking to me, I'm talking to all of us and it's time for us to quit being phony and begin to realize that temptation is coming to every man. We need to stop having church long enough to say, you know what, hey, I've got some issues. I've got some problems. My issues are not your issues but that doesn't mean I don't have them because I do have them and if I don't identify them they will become huge distractions in my life look at somebody you tell them you better you better identify them so there are certain places that you don't go there are certain things you don't do it doesn't matter that other people can do it you can't you got to keep walking do not pass go do not collect two hundred dollars you got to stay focused because what will end up happening is it will end up becoming a distraction, a distraction, not just a distraction, but it could be a Delilah distraction. You know, those kind of, those kind of distractions that, so sometimes you have to look at stuff and say, listen, I can't even afford to give you an inch. I can't give you an inch because if I give you an inch, it's going to take a mile. I, I, I cannot afford to get set back. You are a setback in my life waiting to happen. And so I can't afford that. If I keep laying my head in Samson in the lap of Delilah, eventually she's going to take your hair. She's going to take your strength. She's going to take your vision. She's going to take your life. Oh, I can't keep acting like this is not an issue. This is an issue. And if you have one, identify it, admit it. And whatever you do, stay away from it. It doesn't matter who says it's okay. It ain't okay. I said it ain't okay. It ain't all right. Because it could set you back. It could make you relapse. It could cause you to go back into something that God brought you out of. And it don't matter. My friends said they can. It don't matter what your friends can do. What matters is what you can't do. You, and you got to work out your own salvation. The Bible says with fear and trembling. And until you get some things worked out of you, you better stay away from Delilah. Because you're not strong enough yet. And a man that don't know his own, or a woman that don't know their own weakness, is a fool. Look at somebody, tell them don't be a fool. Sin is expensive. It will cost you your stuff. It will cost you your life. Abram went down into Egypt and he compromised his wife's safety. And the bad thing about it is he didn't even have to do it. But he did it. And the very second, the very minute that he did it. Uh, that's my wife. Uh, that, that's, that, that's, my, that's, that's my sister. He was like, oh God. Why did I? Have you ever said that to yourself? Like, oh, I mean, the very minute. Y'all can't say amen right now, but it's true. The very minute you said to yourself, that was so stupid. What in the world was I thinking? I'm crazy. Why did I do that? You of all people, Abraham. You, how did you get in this conversation? How did you get in that room? How did you get on that website? 
How did you get there? I'll tell you how you got there, sir. You ignored the guardrails that God had put in your life. And now because of that, things that used to be under your control are not under your control anymore. They have become out of control. Why? Because you went down into Egypt. And once you allowed yourself to go past one guardrail over another guardrail and you become undisciplined and you become lazy and you slacken your prayer life and you just chill and you let down your guard and you let down your standard, I'm telling you, your flesh will begin to increase. Your flesh will increase in Egypt. Your flesh will rob you of every promise that God has made to you. Your flesh will start flexing its muscles if you go down into Egypt. I told you, if you give it an inch, it will take a mile. And when it happens, it's so embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Because now the thing that you used to have the victory over Now the thing that you used to have the power over, the thing that used to be under your feet that you used to shout about, the thing that you have reckoned as dead, now it's alive and it's well. And you don't want to tell anybody because how do you tell them that you went down into Egypt? It's embarrassing because so many people respect you. So many people look to you for answers. So many people have confidence in you. And the reason that they have confidence is because you used to have a real prayer life. You used to be an intercessor. You used to be a prayer warrior, Abram. You used to have all kinds of power in your prayer life. So of course people look to you. They believed in you. They trusted in you. So how do you tell them? I don't have the power I used to have. Because I went down into Egypt. I lost my prayer life. I lost my altar. I disregarded the guardrails. Disregarded the guardrails in my life. And that puts you in such a miserable place. And here's why. Because whenever you have had the real power of God in your life. And you don't have it to the dimension that you at one time had it. It messes you up. Because once you've known the real power of prayer, I'm talking about when you tap into that realm where it's not just you praying out of your head, but it comes up out of your spirit. When you have, had, when you have known the real anointing of God, when you've had a real walk with God, when you've had a real commitment with God, a real communion with God, a real relationship with God, you will know the difference between what is genuine and what is generic, what is pure and what is unpure, what is pure and what is tainted, what is true and what is untrue. You know the difference. How many of you know what I'm talking about? If you've ever encountered God, you know what it's like when you tap into the real thing. Hit somebody and tell them, ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. He went down into Egypt. I want you to just follow this with me for a moment. He went down into Egypt. When he did, he picked up a few things that was never the will of God for his life. Picked up a relationship that wasn't the will of God for his life. Picked up a woman by the name of Hagar. Picked up a soul tie that his soul should have never been tied up in. Now he's making wrong decisions, wrong choices. Hooking up with wrong people, making wrong connections. Now he's connected to somebody that ends up pulling an Ishmael out of him. Ishmael, his son, Ishmael, his name means a wild ass. There are certain people that will pull things out of you that you might not even realize you have in you. Oh, he slept with her. She was bound and he slept with the bound. And whenever you sleep with the bound, you're going to be bound yourself because you can't lay down with less and ever expect to get up with more because it does not work like that. Oh, God, help us today. Look at somebody on your right and say, Hagar is waiting for you in Egypt. Tell your other neighbor, Hagar is waiting for you in Egypt. He 
Hagar distracted him, broke his focus. Hagar got him off course. Hagar set this man of God back. She slowed him down and she almost destroyed his marriage, almost destroyed his ministry and delayed his destiny. And he would have never ever been through any of that had he stayed up out of Egypt. But instead of, instead of abiding within the boundaries and the guardrails that were in his life, he climbed over them and he got into trouble that he did not have to get into. I want to tell you today that trouble is waiting for you in Egypt, but God has put a guardrail in your life that is called prayer. Not only did he jeopardize his future and his destiny and his assignment, but he jeopardized his wife's assignment too. Because to endanger Sarah at this point in the scripture would have been to endanger the promise of God. Sarah, you got to understand, was beautiful. She was gorgeous. But in the Bible days, beauty would only set women up. Sarah could have been raped. She could have been abused. She could have, a whole lot of things could have happened to her. This is what I want you to see. Now look how his whole family is at risk because he lost his altar. He ignored the guardrails. He ignored his prayer life. He didn't pay any attention to the boundaries. And so now he compromises her safety. And he did it because he ignored the flashing lights. He ignored the warning signs. His faith got weak. God could have provided for him in a famine. But instead now, he starts losing his faith because he lost his altar. And now, the, he ignore, now he's ignoring the very thing that God put in his life to protect him. And let me tell you something. Whenever you mess up like that, it don't just affect you. Do you hear me? It affects everything that's connected to you. So, if you don't do it for yourself, do it for those that are connected you to you. But whatever you do, hit somebody, tell them, stay out of Egypt, stay out of Egypt. Abram had an altar, but he lost it. And when you lose your altar, you set your whole family up for destruction because they will become exposed to stuff that they would have never been exposed to had you not lost your altar. Exposed to sin, exposed to danger, exposed to disease, exposed to hate, exposed to crime, all because somebody that was riding with you, when you jumped the guardrail and you lost your altar, now every passenger in your car is at risk because of your recklessness. And what I love about God is that when Abram didn't have the guts to speak up for Sarah, God spoke up for Sarah. And God went to Pharaoh and said, if you touch that woman right there, don't you ever lay your hand on that woman right there. Sarah is a praying woman. And if you touch a praying woman, I will cause so much trouble up in here you will have so much adversity. I will shut down everything in Egypt if you touch that woman right there. Church, this is a lesson that we don't hear about a lot today, but there are some things that we need to shut our mouth about, and there are some things that we should not be reaching after, and there are some people that we just don't touch. Don't be grabbing for everything. Maybe that's the reason your life is not coming together, because you are putting your mouth on somebody else's. Look at somebody, tell him, get your mouth off of me. He, the Pharaoh, was sworn by God. He said, don't touch her. All because Abram lost his altar, lost his convictions. Oh my God. Everything was at stake. He thought he was above it all. He worked it out on the journey. Hey, babe, just make sure you tell him I'm your, I'm your brother, that, that, that you're my sister. We'll work it out. 
He thought he was above the gang. But even kings are accountable. Even men of faith are accountable. Women of faith are accountable. Because God is the king of all kings. God said, if you touch her, I'm coming after you, Pharaoh. And you know what? I'm going to tell you something. God says, if, if you keep touching what you're touching, he said, I'm going to come after you. And no, it may not happen all at once. It might just happen little by little. Piece by piece. You might just be like Samson and jump up and get ready to do something that you've always done that's always been easy. And it's all, you've always had the power to do it. But like Samson, you'll begin to recognize, I don't have the power to do this. Why? Because you fooled around and didn't deal with the distractions in your life. See, as long as Samson remained consecrated, as long as he remained aware, as long as he remained on the altar, he, as long as he stayed within his guardrails, he was unconquerable. He was strong, but the problem is that even strong people harbor hidden weaknesses. I said strong people harbor hidden weaknesses, and the secret of this man's strength was in his hair, it was in his consecration, and it was in his altar, and when he lost his altar, he lost his consecration. When he lost his consecration, Consecration. He lost his hair. When he lost his hair, he lost his strength. When he lost his strength, they gouged out his eyes, which means they took away his vision. And little by little, somebody say little by little, little by little, he lost his altar, his consecration, his hair, his strength, his vision. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. He was strong. At least he thought he could withstand all of it. But the Bible says, wherefore, let him that standeth to take heed unless he fall. <laughs> Samson lost his altar. Abram lost his altar. And had it not been for a God that watches over his children, she would have been raped and he would have lost his wife. But God spoke up and started talking to Pharaoh. They all got sick. All of Pharaoh's crew got sick. They were all about to die. They got so sick. Pharaoh knew something had to be up. God said, don't touch that woman. What does he do? He goes and he tells Abram, man, you lied to me. That ain't your sister. Why'd you lie to me? I just like almost touched her. And look at it. We got plagues that have broke out everywhere. People are sick everywhere. We got trouble that's breaking out on the right and on the left. What I want you to do is I want you to take her and I want you to get out of my face and I don't want to ever see you back in here again. Get her and get out of here. And not only did Pharaoh get sick, but all of his palace pimps got sick with him. Because if you share in the crime, you ought to share in the punishment. Get out of here. Abram has lost his character because he lost his courage. He lost his courage because he lost his faith. He lost his faith because he lost his altar. And the only way to get back to where he was, the only recourse that he would have was to retrace his steps. He lays eyes on Sarah. Baby, I'm so glad to see you. Are you okay? Let me, let me just look at you. When I look at you, I, I just get so disgusted with myself. But we're gonna, we're gonna be all right. God spoke up for you, Sarah. I can't even, I can't even take the credit for it. It wasn't me. God spoke up for you. And it caused Pharaoh to release you. To release me. 
And I don't know a whole lot that I can do to get us out of this mess, but I'm going to tell you something. We are going to come out of it. Will you just take my hand, Sarah? Because we're going to come out of this. We may have to cry, but we're coming out of it. It may take you a minute to trust me again, but I'm telling you we're going to come out of it. I failed you, but I promise you this, we're going to come out of this. I lost my courage, my faith, my character. I lost it all, but I promise you, I am going to bring us through this. God is going to help me. I failed you. I failed our family. I failed God. I failed everybody, but I promise you, we will come through this together. I fooled around too long, but we're coming out. Our blessings have been delayed. That we're coming out. I've compromised your safety. Oh my God. And I got to live with that. Every time I laid down. I got to live with the fact that I did that to you. I did stuff that I'm ashamed of. But I'm sorry. That we will come out of this. I hooked up with wrong people. They pulled stuff out of me. I didn't even know was there. I let wrong people in my life. But we will come out. I want you to touch somebody on both sides of you and tell them we're coming out. We're coming out. We're coming out. We're coming out of this. We're coming out of this. We're coming out of this. I don't know who I'm talking to, but somebody needs to hear me. There is a family. There's a man. There's a woman. There's somebody in this room today that needs to hear me when I tell you, you are coming out of this. You are coming out of this. You are coming out of this. And it may not happen with a, in a flash, but you will come out of it. And I tell you that because it's not an event. It is a journey. It is not an event. It is, it is a journey. And you can get out if you want to get out. It might take you a minute, but you can it out. Tell somebody we're coming out. I'm on my way back to that place, Sarah. I'm going to take you. I'm going back to that place. I'm going back to my prayer life. I'm going back to my relationship with God. I'm going back to my consecration. I'm going back to putting him first in my life. I'm going back to where he's the first person I talk to in the morning. And he's the last person I talk to at night. I'm going back to building my altar. Oh my God, you have been so good to me. How could I have ever went so low when you have been so good? But I promise you, God, I'll never forget forget what you have done in my life. How can I ever forget how you came and you rescued us? I remember God. I remember the relationship that we had. I remember how when I woke up in the morning I wanted to talk to you. When I laid down at night, I wanted to lay some things on you. I remember that I'm going back to that. I'm going, I'm going back to my altar. I'm going, to, I'm going back to my altar. I'm going to recognize the guardrails that you have put in my life. I should have never been over on that side of the guardrail. I should have been here. I should have been within these boundaries. And I would have never lost my altar. And Abram went back to the place where his tent was at the beginning back to the place of the altar. And it was there that Abram called on the name of the Lord. He went back to his consecration. He went back to his communion with God. He went back to his prayer life. And let me tell you something. When your altar has been destroyed, if you want it back, you got to do some building. You got to build. Look at somebody and tell them you got to build it back. How do, I re how do I build it back? You build it back by going to God and say, God, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Lord, renew in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Oh God, cleanse me from my secret faults. Have your way in my life. Cleanse me from unrighteousness because God, I want my altar back more than I want anything. If I can get my altar, I can get everything else back. But God, 
I'll get my friends back. I'll get my reputation back. But I first have to get my altar back. So I'm asking you today, God, give me my altar. If I never get the job, I gotta have the altar. If I never get the house, I got to have an altar. If I never have a friend, if I never have a child, if I never have a husband, if I never have a wife, I have got to have an altar in my life. And I will worship until I worship my way back. I will cry until I get back there. I'll praise until I get back there. But I got to have my altar. I want my altar back. I want my name back. I want my reputation back. I want my credit back. And whatever it costs, I will pay the full price. Do not put it on sale. Sarah, I failed at being your husband. But I'm going to change that. Because I'm going to get my altar back. You know, the roles could be reversed and Sarah could be saying, I failed at being your wife, but I'm gonna get my altar back because I gotta have it. Because when you don't have an altar, it's like being at home without a phone. You just feel totally disconnected. So if you've lost your altar and you found yourself in Egypt, you got to rebuild it in order for it to be rebuilt. Some nails have to be driven. There's got to be some noise. It won't be quiet. The hammer's got to ring. If you're going to rebuild back what you've lost because you've ignored the guardrails that God has put in your life. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I want to pray a corporate prayer for every person who says, I want my altar back. I want to ask you, I got a minute, I want you to get out of your seat and come to this altar. If that's you and you say, I want to build it back. I want to build it back. I want to build it back. I want to get back to the point where I recognize the boundaries, the lines that God has put in my life. I want to be the leader of my house again. I want to be the leader of my home again. I want to be a person of character and integrity. And I'm willing to commit to God and do what it takes to get it back. Maybe you're watching online today and you say, I want it back. I want to build it back, Pastor Brady. I want to build it back. I can't live like this. I can't live one. I can't confess one thing and be something else. I'm ready to come clean before God. If that's you, I want you to lift up your hands all over this room. Wherever you are, lift up your hands, open your mouth and tell God, God help me. I'm coming back to the heart of worship because it's all about you. And I'm asking you to restore unto me. Restore my house, restore my children. Restore my integrity.